Welcome to Legal Connect, where each week we sit down with top lawyers to demystify the process of hiring and working with legal counsel in today's world. From navigating the legal system to understanding your rights, our expert guests provide valuable insights and tips for anyone facing a legal challenge. So tune in, take notes, and join us as we explore the ins and outs of the legal profession. A quick disclaimer, anything discussed in the podcast is general tips and advice, not formal legal advice. Always consult a lawyer. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Legal Connect podcast. Today, I am so excited to be joined by Mosi Taylor-Cole. He is a family law lawyer at Square Law Group, and to date, he's worked mostly in family law and really understands that being involved in legal matters can be stressful. He ensures that his clients are properly cared for and that their matters are always handled with privacy and respect, and his practice these days mostly consists of high-conflict parenting, child support, and property matters. So I know we're going to have a really interesting conversation and we're going to dig into all aspects of family law today uh, but yeah maybe i'll kind of just turn it over to you mosi welcome to the podcast yeah, and thank you for having me yeah yeah really happy I, we haven't actually had that many family lawyers on so i think this is going to be a really okay. you know value packed conversation for the audience and for me too i'm sure i'll learn a thing or two that i didn't know about <laughs> it's it's an interesting feel it's never a dull moment in family law so yeah, I, I can imagine. And so just kind of just start, like maybe you can kind of walk us through, well, firstly, how you got into the legal field in general, but then specifically, mm. what drew you to the area of family law? Because I do feel like it takes a very special kind of person to want to work in such a difficult area. Yeah, so I always kind of wanted to be a lawyer since I was probably about 14 years old. My parents were big on us watching documentaries as a kid. And so I remember we had watched this one documentary about David Milgard, and he was wrong Canadian that was wrongfully accused. Um, unfortunately, he passed away about a year or so ago. And um, that to me was kind of like the start of it. I remember saying to my parents, like, I want to do that, like just lawyer in general. I didn't know what area or whatnot. Uh, and then, yeah, I ended up, you know, I did my undergrad at the University of Lethbridge in human resource management. And knowing that I kind of wanted to go to law school, I just started trying to pursue different avenues of which schools to apply to, which ones to get in. And ultimately, I chose to go to school um, in England. So I chose a, you know international study and I went to the University of Leicester in Leicester, England. And so, you know, good experience, uh, still not really knowing much about what I wanted to do in terms of area of law. I kind of narrowed it down a little bit to family law and maybe corporate uh you know i think the corporate bit kind of came from suits was really popular at that time it had just started like the show had been i think on like season one or two so oh. it kind of had that, that appeal to the corporate law right that was a great show great show yeah and so uh when i came back to canada i had to do some qualifications here so that i could practice here and by that point as i was doing my qualifications i realized that you know family law at least for me, in my mind, was the one area that I could probably really help people. And I that's something that kind of just resonates with me, you know, in, in my volunteer work and everything else in kind of my life. And so I tried to target like boutique family law firms so that I could, you know, get in there and learn from them. And I got fortunate. I did. I found a firm that, you know, kind of took a chance on me and they took me on and trained me and mentored me. And I've been doing family law ever since. So I think I started off working in family law in 2014 as a summer student before I did my articles. And then I was called to the bar in 2016 and then still just doing family law. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, it's quite a journey you've had, too. And I can imagine that studying abroad in England was was quite exciting for you. Yeah. yeah. What do you think? Like, just kind of, let's look at that experience for a moment. Mm -hmm. What do you think that maybe just getting out of Canada and studying abroad, meeting other people internationally, how do you think that that really helped kind of shape your legal education and, and how you practice law now? Do you think that those, you know, new perspectives, maybe opening some new doors, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it definitely, in the terms of my practice, it's nice because I went to school as well with quite a few Canadians that were from Ontario. So if they come across files or a matter that has, you know, the Alberta is the jurisdiction, I get a lot of referrals that way, which is nice, uh, which I don't think I would have necessarily gotten if I had gone to school here. But in terms of going to school overseas, I don't know. I it, it allowed me to travel and interact with people from other cultures. Like I traveled throughout 
Europe. I think I did 13 countries in two years. Like I really, yeah, I really, really um, wanted to kind of maximize my opportunity whilst I was there. So it is nice in the sense that, you know, if I have a client that is, let's say, from Croatia, uh, you know, I can kind of connect with them a little bit on that different level because I've been through Croatia. I've been through Spain. Uh, I understand a little bit of some of these European cultures of how the household structure and whatnot in certain European cultures. So it has helped a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that you nowadays, you're mostly serving kind of Southern Alberta. So like Airdrie, Calgary, maybe a little bit more south as well. But would you say then you can kind of help people from all over the place? Like you're working with people even in Croatia and that kind of thing? Like anybody can work with you? Well, it depends. Um, I have a client right now that is actually, he lives in Peru. So you wow. can, yeah, yes, exactly. Now he was here originally, and then he decided that he was going to move down to Peru. Uh, same thing, I had a client that retained me actually from Chile uh, as well too. So it, it just depends on the facts and the jurisdictional issues. You know, is there a child here? Is there property here? It, it's those different types of things where then by you're now communicating with somebody that is in another country. It's not a large part of my practice, but it, it does happen from time to time. Yeah, yeah well, that's really awesome. I think that it's awesome that technology has really opened those doors now that lawyers can really work with people from all over the place, right? That's it, exactly. And I mean, I you know, I can't practice law in those those jurisdictions. Like I couldn't practice in Peru or in Chile, but definitely because of COVID, it did people are used now to, you know, Zoom meetings, like right virtually, like what we're doing. And yeah. as a result, a lot of people are more comfortable. You can kind of cast a wider net per se. The only difficulty is that now that the pandemic, you know, is kind of coming to an end, uh, the courts have do require us to be back in court personally. So right. for those of us that had files, like I have some files in Red Deer, um, if you had a file like I was saying Grand Prairie, now you got to drive to go yeah. to ground theory if you got to go to court. So <clears throat> that becomes a little bit taxing. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine uh, <laughs> driving to Grand Prairie during the winter in Alberta would not be the most ideal oh, situation. <laughs> horrible. I mean, they make exceptions, don't get me wrong, from time to time, but it, it, it's still not ideal. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And before we kind of jump into more of the specifics mm -hmm. of family law, because we'll get into all that stuff and the sort of cases that you deal with and your approach and all those things. But I want to talk a little bit more about your background and your involvement in your community, because I know that volunteering is very important to you. And it's a big part of what you do both as a lawyer and just as a, a human as well. Um, you're actively involved with a number of associations and organizations. So can you talk a little bit more about your experience, especially when it comes to maybe being involved with youth programs, because that's probably a big part of your work and your volunteering, right? Yes, yeah, I would say that my volunteering with youth, I kind of stumbled upon it a little bit. When I had come back from England, my first year, I wasn't, I was just studying for my qualification exams. And so I wasn't doing much in all honesty. I was working part time as I studied and it was my good friend. His dad was our football coach at our old high school, St. Mary's High School. And he had said to me like, hey, look, why don't you go and my dad says you can come by and help out. Like you might be good for you to be, you know, you could talk to the kids about your experience in law school. And I was like, well, I don't know much technically about football. I love football, but I'm not a coach, right? right. And so I, I went and it started with that. And then I ended up coaching football initially for about three years. Oh, and wow. that's where I started to realize that I wanted to focus a lot of what I did volunteer wise um, with youth. I mean, they are the looters of the future. Like my lifestyle when I get older, and this world will be better because of them, right? So obviously, you know, if I can impart anything or just give back to them, that's kind of the standpoint that I want to take. And so I would like to incorporate that more into my practice in terms of, you know, doing like children's counsel work. I think it's very important for those, um, for parties who are going through high conflict parenting matters and they have to get lawyers for their child. While that aspect of it is sad, it, at least the good thing that should come out of it is the child at least have a good lawyer that can advocate for them. And that is, you know, just there for them, you know what I mean? So that's something I'm trying to expand more in my practice uh, and hopefully I'm able to as, as time goes on. But most of my other things that I do, yes, I'm a, a youth mentor with the Rotary Club 
in the stay at school program. Uh, and that's been quite rewarding. I was also part of the youth mentorship program with the Calgary Black Chambers. That was also rewarding as well too. So anything dealing with kids, I'll always sign up for. <laughs> that's awesome. I saw that you're a little bit of a celebrity as well, that you were occasionally <laughs> to CBC Calgary. It, the panel is called the Eye Openers Unconventional Panel and CBC <laughs> National News, The Conversation. So yeah. A little bit of celebrity in our midst here. <laughs> I don't know. It's fun. It's fun. You know, I'll tell you about those. That the, that opportunity kind of just stumbled. I fell into my lap. And yeah. I think I jumped at it because I was like, it's not law. So it's nice to just talk about, because, you know, the, the one thing about being a lawyer is that everybody finds out a lawyer and they have a legal question or something and they want to hear more about this stuff from you, right? So I saw it as an opportunity to be able to talk about other things that I'm interested in um, other than the law. So that's the nice bit about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I think it's definitely the case. And I, it probably also just helps to like, you know, have get these conversations out there. Because I feel like usually the day to day, you're talking to your clients, you're talking to other lawyers, but I think the public doesn't get to see a lot of the issues that are maybe going on, right? So yeah. it, it's nice you get to go out there and just kind of broadcast it to a bit of a wider audience as well. Mm, exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, great. So yeah, let's kind of dive a little bit more into family law specifically. And really, like, I'm curious, like, what do you see your role in helping families navigate legal issues? And is there certain issues that you um, deal with most frequently, like certain kinds of, like, I'm not sure if there's certain classifications of family law that you do more than others? Or can you just kind of tell us a little bit about that to start with? Yeah, so kind of how I see my role is, I essentially, the problem already exists. And that's the one thing I tell a lot of people, and sometimes I have to tell clients, is that the, the lawyers, unfortunately, well, fortunately, don't create the problem, right? The problem already exists. So I see my role as I have to come in and try and repair that issue as best as I can, but I also have to try and manage, and I always say that the law and what clients are looking for is like a Venn diagram. And so they barely overlap just a little bit like this i'm not doing this image much justice right but but my 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 thing is to manage the client and say hey you know i understand your perspective and and this is your position on this this is what the law says this is where your position kind of accommodates in the law or hey quite frankly it doesn't so we need to readjust and come back with something a little bit more reasonable in terms of expectations or proposals so that's how i see my role as being and then it's to communicate that to the other side and try to facilitate some discussions for resolution and if not then you have to kind of take the matter to court within family law so like the second part of your question i mean it consists of so many different areas mm -hmm. so people automatically think you know family law divorce and yes that's a large aspect of it but it also deals with couples who are not married um I mean, the public will refer to them as common law couples. That's not the actual legal phrase, but let's say for this sake, we'll say common law partners. Uh, it deals with common law separations, right? It deals with child support issues, parenting issues, division of matrimonial or family property. It deals with grandparents seeking to have uh, contact with their grandchild. It deals with adoptions, surrogacy, um, protection orders, uh, you know, uh, similar to restraining orders, but within the family context. So uh, there's probably even more that I'm not listing at this moment, but the, it, it is very all encompassing in terms of dealing with the family dynamic. Yeah, and I would imagine that actually overlaps quite a bit with social work or correct me if I'm wrong, like, are you working with like caseworkers and social workers on a lot of your issue, like the issues that you're dealing with or? Well, well, that's one of the things that I said, I was probably some I'm forgetting, child welfare. So in the child welfare matter, when social workers or the government is involved, uh, children's services is involved, yes, then you would be working typically not with the social worker per se. They are um, more in line with the director's office, um, which is, you know, Alberta Justice. And so you're at times against them, <laughs> but yeah. sometimes you are working with them because you're trying to, part of the child welfare matters is you are trying to help your client mitigate some of the damage. And part of that is complying and working with the suggestions that the director's office and the social worker may be suggesting in order for them to keep their child and, and to have them not take away guardianship from them. So sometimes you are working with them, but if you end up in trial, then you're ultimately working against them. So. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. It sounds like there, there's a lot of things, like you said, that people, they automatically go to divorce law and things like that. But I think, you know, thinking about how these family dynamics, they can obviously be quite complicated. Like you said, there's marriage involved, there's grandparents, there's, you know, common law and like all these different mm -hmm. things kind of factor in that probably makes it infinitely more complicated, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, so when it comes to that, like, what are the most challenging aspects of representing your clients in these kinds of cases? And how do you personally, through your approach, address those? Mm -hmm. The most challenging part is kind of what I refer to with the Venn diagram is, is sometimes tempering expectations because a person comes in, like when I say to everybody, it's like, this is someone's life. Like, you know, I've never been divorced, right? I mean, the closest thing I can say is, you know, you have a couple of breakups here and there throughout the course of your life, but that's nothing in comparison to a divorce or a separation from a long time partner. And so it is emotionally driven for majority of them. It's emotionally driven. And that's very tough to tell someone that, you know, your emotions don't matter or not that it doesn't matter. Right. But it doesn't have any bearing on, you know, the facts or the law and how the situation may kind of turn out. And so you have to be very sensitive to that and you have to respect that this is how they're feeling. So that's the toughest part is because you're trying to juggle being respectful to someone's emotions and not dismissing them, but also trying to say, okay, look, this is the law. This is what I can do. It may not be in line with what you want in terms of what you perceive as justice for you or the perceived injustice that you may have received from your spouse. Yeah. So that that is probably the most difficult part of the role, quite frankly. Uh, I think sometimes too that the next difficult part is in the litigation aspect when you do have to take a matter to court. You know, sometimes your facts are good and you know what you're gonna get. Sometimes they're not and you have to be creative in your arguments. And it is, you know, I use the phrase any given Sunday. And so sometimes, you know, you may not get exactly what you want. You think that you're going in and you have a game plan and it can be completely different when you get to court because of the judge, because of the factors, there's so many different things. And an outcome that you may not have even thought about is what may be given to you. So that is definitely the next, you know, I think difficult part of, of the role itself is that, you know, you can't really guarantee any success and you don't know what's going to happen in court. Yeah. And I can help but wonder too, due to the very challenging and very sensitive nature of a lot of these issues, do you ever have trouble kind of like leaving that and checking that at the door at the end of the day, so to speak, or like how do you kind of separate yourself from that when you know that the, the decisions and the things that you you are working on have such a huge impact in these people's lives. Like, how does that kind of mentally affect you? Not to go too deep here into <laughs> therapy, no, but, no, uh, no. It's okay. It's a, you know, it's uh, it's it's a good question. Thank you. I think for me, I, I'm very fortunate in the sense that it doesn't the issue itself doesn't bother me. Like, I don't take it home. It doesn't sit with me or have to talk with it, um, you know, to my partner about and stuff like that. Uh, my colleague, for him, he, he did a little bit of family law and he is not, like, it sits with him. It would bother him and he would take it home with him. That's not the case for me. I think what aspect of just family law practice in general that worries me sometimes it's like the mental health aspect of my client per se mm -hmm. um sometimes i really do worry about that because sometimes they come in and they are you can see they're like emotionally distraught and sometimes they don't go to counseling which i think is quite frankly needed when you're going through a divorce and it's not my position or a separation and it's not my position to force them into that and sometimes you get a bad result in court uh, you know and unfortunately that may affect their life let's say in the terms of parenting maybe they don't get the parenting that they wanted and now they can only see their kid once every other week that's tough on someone who truly cares about their child and now that's what they have to kind of deal with so i worry about the mental health aspect on some of my clients uh, sometimes i'll just do like a courtesy call i call it just to check in to see how they're doing but that would be the only thing i think that sometimes i wonder like is this person truly gonna be okay yeah, I think that's nice that you do offer that courtesy check in. I think it shows that you actually care about your clients beyond, you know, obviously going beyond just a business relationship. You actually care about their lives and their well being, right? Yeah, I think it's important, you know, because ultimately they have to function 
like outside of this, their life carries on. Like I tell everybody, there's a life after separation or divorce. I'm just a small part in dealing with this to try, because the law says that there's certain things that need to be done if you're parting ways and there's, let's say, children involved or property or, you know, it's a long-term relationship. So that's just my small function in the whole kind of cosmic experience, I guess, of, of the life, right? And so I think that, yeah, you know, there's life beyond this. And I just want my clients to kind of know that. And some of them are alone, like their family was their world. And now they're alone in a basement suite or in a one bedroom apartment. And that can be tough. So, you know, a little bit of compassion goes a long way, just so people know they're going to get through something. Yeah, absolutely. And I also wonder, when it comes to kind of making it a little bit easier on the families you're working with, do you intentionally try to keep the courses or to keep the cases, sorry, from going to court by things like mediation or other sorts of tools that you can deploy? Because I imagine that just adding the court aspect and dragging those long, you know, drawn out court cases can add a lot of undue stress and trauma even to the family, right? Yes, I mean, resolution is it's resolution is almost a built-in component to a family law matter. The courts kind of essentially mandate you to do some for, some form of, we call alternative dispute resolution, ADR. Uh, so it's automatically kind of built in. But I tell all my clients is you really don't want to go before a judge or an arbitrator because they don't know you at yeah. all. Yeah. Um, and they're going to make a decision on your life that can really affect you. It may be in your favor, um, but it, so it could have be good a good effect or it could be bad. So I try and tell people you're not going to always get exactly what you're looking for. Again, sometimes you do. It's rare, but we need to try and find the middle ground whereby. You may not be super happy, but you're just happy enough. And same with the other side. That's kind of the the line that you're trying to find where, again, they, they're like, you know, uh, I left this on the table, but okay, I got this. So you know, that's, that's where we try to strive for. But I, I tell everybody, look, if we can try to resolve this beforehand, that's what we want to do. It's not worth going to court. And sometimes you have to, um, but, you know, ultimately, it will kind of direct you as to where you want to go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Why, save the stress if you can, obviously, through other, other measures, right? Yes, exactly. And, and let's talk about the children more for a sec or kind of shift our mm. focus there. So, you know, in these cases, I'm, I'm assuming you're usually you're representing one of the parents or grandparents or whoever it is. So obviously yes. you're working for and hired by the adults in the situation most mm -hmm. time. Uh, but how do you really, really kind of consider and prioritize the needs of the children that are involved in these cases? Yeah, well, the test for kids is called the best interests of the child. And so there's a list of factors that the court has outlined that you need to look at when you're dealing with matters <clears throat> surrounding children. And so we have we have to essentially follow that. And, and again, another challenge is what your client may want or may think is in the best interest of the child is more so in their best interest than it is for the child. So again, you have to kind of regulate that position to fit with the law. And so it is it is a fine line. You know, you have a lot of people that come to you and the issue, let's say schooling, they want their child to be in this specific school, but it's mainly because it's convenient for them to drop off. But right. if the child's been in a school for the last three years, it's probably in the child's best interest to continue in that school for another two or three years until they have to go to the next, you know, from grade school to junior high or to high school, et cetera. So those are the, that's one example of one that can be sometimes difficult for clients to accept. But once you show them that this is the law, this is the legislation, they pretty much get on board most times. Yeah. And are you communicating directly with the children or is that somebody else, like a different third party that's coming in and doing that? Like, how are you kind of gauging well, but like, uh, other than getting the information and like the facts, mm -hmm. what's actually going on from the parents, right? Mm -hmm. Like, are you talking to the kids directly? No. So typically what happens is, you know, not all parenting matters have to involve <clears throat> the child getting legal representation. But if it does, like if we're at a point, let's say with parenting, where let's say it's one client wants to have shared parenting, uh, the other client is opposed to it. Part of their reason is that, you know, they don't like mom or they don't like dad uh, that's something whereby you know we would get let's say children's counsel to represent the child because it's a 
neutral third party that can kind of advance the child's, you know, interests or whatnot to the court. And there's different approaches that Children's Council will take. So that's typically a situation whereby we would get Children's Council involved. But normally, no, we don't have contact with the children. Um, if they need their voice needs to be heard, then a, a neutral third party will, will take care of them. Yeah, that makes total sense. So I guess it's hard for you to be impartial sometimes because you're representing one parent or the other. Right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then just to kind of take us to a moment where a higher note now, I know we kind of come <laughs> like the heavier side of your work and some of the challenges that you're really dealing with here. But um, I'd love to hear a story of like a particularly rewarding experience or just something that really stuck with you, like a moment throughout your career that really kind of reaffirmed for you why you went into family law in the first place and, and you felt had an impact. You know, I'd have to say that actually had to be this week. Oh, wow. I had client, yeah, I had a client. Uh, I've been representing him since 2021. Um, <clears throat> great guy good dad and um, really cares about his kid. So both parents do actually They're like, you know, I've never seen a situation where you can tell that they ultimately really, really care about their like together. They, they really care about this boy, but, but again, <clears throat> different positional issues in terms of the matter that we were dealing with, which put them at odds. And so we ended up, um, going to arbitration, and we ended up actually going to an appeal of the arbitration. And so the outcome was a mixed success. And, and it was interesting because, you know, I sent the decision to my client and I said, hey, look, this is the outcome. It's mixed success. It's not fully what we wanted, but hey, the reality is, is that the, the, the key aspect of what you, you wanted to achieve, we got. And so he, I followed up with him on Monday because, I again, it was a courtesy call. I just want to see how he was doing after having a week to kind of read through the decision and sit on it and digest it a little bit. And he thanked me. And that's the stuff that, I'll be honest, family law is kind of a thankless job, <laughs> unfortunately. And it's it's those clients, like, you know, he thanked me. He said, you know, I know you've done everything that you can. You're always looking out for me and my family. Like, I really appreciate that. And that's the kind of thing that I'm like, okay, I can do this job, right? You know, it's those it's those things that kind of sit with you. Um, so that's that's just one recent story. But it's interesting that you brought that up because amongst family law lawyers, I know when I was in my articles, my um, principal had told me like keep a folder of the thank yous, like the email thank yous, because on days when it doesn't go your way in court or it's just a rough day read those again because those are the things that will help you kind of get through it because unfortunately it, it is a thankless job so yeah i think that's good advice for any lawyer no matter what they feel especially family law because it is yeah such difficult sensitive issues but yeah. i think every lawyer now needs to go and back to their office and make a thank you folder I think. yeah <laughs> exactly yeah. Actually, one thing I want to back up a little bit, because I think yeah. I, I meant to ask this towards the beginning, but I guess I should probably, for people out there that maybe, you know, haven't worked with a lawyer before or have never gone through the process of hiring a lawyer, mm -hmm. at what point in, I, I know it's probably individual to each situation as well, but yes. generally, at what point should someone, if they're going through some kind of family issue, whether it's a parenting issue or, um, you know, maybe it's a child welfare thing or whatever it is, at what point should they bring in legal counsel? Like, should it be as soon as possible? Like, because I imagine you don't want to get the, let the issue get too far until the point where things, you know, there's additional factors that are complicating yeah. the matter. Like, when do people, like, at what point do they hire you on to, to the case, really? You know, it really depends for a lot of people. I see it at completely different stages. It depends on the facts, depends on the person. You know, in an ideal world, you, you know, your partner would tell you that, you know, they want to separate. The two of you would be amicable. You'd talk about all the issues. You'd compile, a, you know, you deal with your parenting yourself and you sit down and put into a Word document and then you take it to a lawyer and say, this is what we've done. Can you put this into an agreement for us? And we would give independent legal advice and they'd be on their way, right? Yeah. Um, that, that's happens. an ideal situation. And it does happen from time to time. Don't get me oh, wrong. I have had that great. happen certain mm -hmm. times. But what I tell most people is, you know, one, hiring a lawyer shouldn't just be like, you know, 
first typing in on Google, you know, divorce lawyer, right? And then picking the first one, you really should kind of read up, um, talk to some people that you know that have gotten divorced, ask them what they liked about their lawyer, what they didn't like, because it is a pairing. It, it really is. It is kind of a fit because you're in that with that person maybe for a long period of time. There's some files that take years to resolve. So you do want to make sure that it's the right fit in choosing a lawyer. Um, I tell a lot of people is you don't have to dive head in and just retain a lawyer right off the bat. Most lawyers will do one hour consults. Some yeah. do them for free. Some do it half an hour for free. Some do them at a reduced rate, like $99 for a one hour consult. Some it's their regular rate, but that one hour could be probably the most beneficial advice or at least information, more likely legal information that you could receive than maybe the rest of your, your matter. So I tell people, you know, you can start with that and then see if this is something that one, can you sit down with your partner and resolve it amicably now that you kind of know the structure of like, there's going to be child support, spouse support, property division, this and that. Uh, if not, do you one, have the funds to retain a lawyer full time? If you don't, do you have the means and mainly it's the, the emotional wherewithal to self-represent or do you want to try and do it kind of like as a limited scope retainer, which is where you hire a lawyer to do some things, but then you do the rest. So that's what I would say to people is, you know, first, maybe you could slow it down a little bit. If, if you can, sometimes you can't, sometimes things wrap up so quickly that you're stuck and you just have to get a lawyer to deal with it right away. But if you can do a one hour consult. Yeah. I think those initial consults, absolutely the most valuable thing like anybody could probably benefit from like yes. even just like the personality fit right because as you said it's a very close pairing yes you keep this person for years and you want to make sure that that person has your back right like that's it and and you know there's numerous factors like i tell most people lawyers are managing multiple files right like in in a day i could work on maybe up to five five files and and it might be just as little as sending an email on one but you're always moving around and so some lawyers have bigger practices than others uh, some lawyers care have large practices but the issues aren't large or or have depth so time frames for certain lawyers in terms of responses and being able to get things done um it differs so i tell people ask the lawyer like what's your policy on you know response time and whatnot and you know i'm always honest with my clients and i let them kind of know where i'm at at that point in time and I, I even say to some like you know unfortunately given your time frame i don't think i'm the right person to assist you so. yeah actually funny enough you're the first lawyer to actually mention response times as being a factor <laughs> you should think about when you're hiring yeah. like, myself i'm a very anxious like where if someone doesn't respond to me a day i'm like yeah. I feel forgotten. I feel neglected. Like I right. need to, you know, to be like, especially in those issues where there is like a, you know, a life altering issue going on. That's right. Yeah. I yeah. think, I think it is an important question. And I mean, also too, I think, you know, ask the lawyer, you know, can I follow up and this and that, and like, you know, if my clients have send me an email saying, Hey, I'm just looking for an update. I'm not charging them for that. Cause to me, they're just inquiring about their file. They have a right to do that. How, why should I charge them? Why should I charge them for them to follow up? That's that's ridiculous, you know? So ask these type of questions and, and you'll be able to see from the response you get and depending on the type of person you are, if that is a fit in itself as well too. Because as you said, the lawyer is dealing with the other side. So you're waiting, like you tell the lawyer your instructions and the lawyer communicates that over and then you're just waiting. So yeah that's it yeah or communicating like how long of a wait is normal right like you know like you can like yeah. the lawyer can manage your expectations and be okay like we can expect to wait you know anywhere yes. from four to six weeks for a response from this that's person it. Right? yes yeah yeah exactly yeah all right awesome well, i'm gonna wrap up with just a little bit of rapid fire questions a little okay. bit of surprise so we can okay. get to on a more personal level okay I always love this section the most because i feel like it's where <laughs> the lawyers really uh we really get to see the individual personalities come yeah. out all so, right let's see uh, so the first question I have for you is, um, what was a book that you maybe read recently? It could be, you know, the last few months or last year that really had an impact on the way that you think or shifted your perspective in some way. The autobiography of Malcolm X written by Alex Haley. He's the author of Roots. That one definitely for me, um, 
especially, especially as a person of color, really did have a lasting effect on me. And then the other one as well, too, I'll, I'll say one more, is um, The Way of the Fight by George St. Pierre, the Canadian uh, mixed martial artist. I don't know if that one is written by him or he wrote it in conjunction with somebody else, but okay. just his philosophies and his discipline and his story, uh, it's definitely a story of like fortitude, self-preservation, self preservation, self-belief. Uh, so it's quite uh, quite interesting, yeah. And what was that one called, sorry, the second one? What was it the, called? The Way of the Fight by George St. Okay. Pierre. Very cool, okay. I, I'd be interested to see how the, those two books almost feel like they would fit together really well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. And yeah. then the, the next question I have for you is, if you weren't practicing law, if you weren't a lawyer, let's pretend you, you know, had a time machine, you were back in time, what do you think you'd be doing instead? Like what other profession might you, uh, might have called to you? You know, that's interesting. I would say, well, it's funny you ask this. When I was in my articles, when I was coaching football, I remember saying to my principals, like, you know, if this law thing doesn't work out, I'm going to go coach football. Wow. Uh, so, but, but, you know, that's changed now. That's actually changed. I don't know if I would go and coach football. I think I've gotten the journalism itch from doing the cbc things here and there okay. so i would probably go into radio i like radio uh i go into radio or like broadcasting like television or something like that i think is probably what i would do yeah i will say that you have a really great voice and uh on air <laughs> thank you for radio or television or something <laughs> oh, like that. thank you that's sweet <laughs> what would your segment be called i'm curious like what would you cover legal topics or would you <laughs> unrelated to the law you know i don't know if i would i think i would want to do just kind of similar to what i do on the unconventional panel just like everyday topics relating to either canadians or to the city of calgary i would love to do topics relating to members within the like the bipoc community um or issues dealing you know with black youth or this and that like those would kind of be the things i would focus on yeah well maybe that can happen in conjunction to your legal career perhaps maybe we'll I, see I hope it'd be maybe i do a podcast and start out with that i don't know <laughs> There you go. Well, this yeah. is a good springboard for it today. You yeah. Know, to start. So um, that is amazing. It, yeah, it's it's been great learning all these different things. Obviously, you're very knowledgeable about family law. You're very passionate about it. And you also have this you know, this great story. And, and you have a lot to share with the world, I think. So thank you. Um, how can people connect with you? Yeah, like, do you do anything else online? Like, how you know, whether it's through your like website, through Square Law Group, um, right. your personal profiles, just go ahead and plug all your channels. Okay, so, you know, I, I actually just finished working on the website like two weeks ago, but we haven't launched it yet. So I'm hoping within the next week that Square Law Group website will be up so you can find us there, www.squarelawgroup.ca. But in the meantime, uh, if anybody wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, you see my name uh, at the bottom there. Feel free, just send me in the message that you heard me on the podcast and uh, yeah uh, we can connect through LinkedIn and then if I can send you my work contact information from there so LinkedIn perfect all right well yeah thank you so much Mosi this was a, a great conversation and is there anything lastly last word you want to leave the audience with today no I just think you know divorce can be again like as I said before it can be scary but there is a life after divorce or after a separation and you know it is daunting kind of going through that but i think sometimes you have to try to set the emotions aside a little bit if you can and to kind of get through and push through so you can conclude your matter and enjoy your life after the fact yeah very wise words and i think adding on to that too finding the right people around you to support you through well, both during the while it's going on and afterwards right that's it exactly yeah Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you everybody out there so much for listening and stay tuned for the next episode. And maybe we'll have Mosi back to chat again with us. Uh, oh, definitely. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Legal Connect podcast. We hope you found our conversation informative and helpful in navigating the process of hiring and working with a lawyer. Make the process of hiring a lawyer easier than ever and ensure the best match possible through our platform, Logic.com. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.